And Teresa is 15 years old when our story begins. And Teresa has a family with parents who love her and love her siblings. Teresa was raised in a suburban, wealthy community. She loves playing volleyball and she loves talking on the phone. She has a dog to feed and chores to do when she gets home. And she has siblings that she fights with. Does this sound familiar to anyone? It sounded familiar to me. And one day when Teresa is attending her public high school, where she makes all A's, a cute boy offers her a ride home. And without hesitation, Teresa takes this ride home. He's a classmate. Why wouldn't she? She's 15. So they meet after school. And as they drive through their suburban neighborhood, she gets a little nervous because they pull into his driveway and not her driveway. And he says to her very apologetically, Teresa, I'm so sorry. I forgot my football gear inside. Could you just come in with me and we'll get my football gear. It'll just take a minute. I hope I don't keep you from anything. But I don't want you to wait in this car. Come inside and I'll give you a cold soda. So Teresa is, again, nervous about this. She can tell there is not any parents at home and she is only 15. But she thinks it'll only be a minute there's a cold soda inside, and it's a hot day. So she goes in with him. And as she sips on this cold soda, she wakes up about two hours later. She is bruised, and she is bleeding, and she had been raped. And filled with confusion and shame, she picks up her clothes and puts them on. And she immediately decides she's not going to tell anyone what has happened here, not her family, not her friends, not her teachers. Teresa makes her way home, and she stuffs those clothes into the washer. She makes her way upstairs to the shower and goes to bed. And Teresa returns to school the next day, like nothing had happened. And the boy finds her, and he says, Teresa, I want to apologize for what happened. Now, Teresa is furious, but she agrees to meet this boy after school because she wants to hear this apology. And so they meet out by his car. And he says, I'm so sorry, but my cousin, my cousin found out what happened. And he says, unless you sleep with him, he's going to tell everyone what kind of girl you are. And Teresa refuses. And they go back and forth for a while. And then the boy pulls out of his back pocket one after another after another. Polaroid. And somebody had been above them taking pictures. And from the pictures, the sex looks consensual. But not only that, this is an instant reminder of the trauma she had just experienced. So reluctantly, Teresa agrees to sleep with the cousin. And this is the plan. She's going to go home. She's going to receive a phone call. She'll sneak out, and she'll go with this boy. Well, he will drive her to another location. And she does it. And of course, the cousin does not return the pictures. But for the next two years, Teresa will repeat this plan. She will go home from school, and she will do chores just like everyone else. And she will go to bed, and she will receive a phone call. And she will sneak out, and the boy will drive her to different locations where she is raped and sold and re-raped for the next two years. Teresa is an American girl who was exploited on American soil. And to give us a perspective or a timeline, these events took place in 1968, which means that American girls have been exploited on American soil for a long time. This isn't a new phenomenon. It's just simply that we're just now paying attention. Teresa didn't plan to be raped. She didn't plan to be exploited. But there she was trapped in this cycle of exploitation. What was it that kept her there? Right? She wasn't locked behind a key. She wasn't tied to a radiator. What, what kept Teresa in this system of exploitation? Shame. Shame. Yeah, what else? Fear. 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 Yeah, shame, fear, abuse. This is what kept her there. 
And as I thought about Teresa and how she didn't plan to be exploited, I thought about other American girls who are exploited every day and they don't plan to be exploited. I thought about women who work in the sex industry. And as an oral processor, I don't know if there's other oral processors in the audience, how do we process our thoughts? Orally, right? We have, to, we have to talk about it. I talk to my roommate all the time until she shuts the door and says I'm done. And um, we have to process these things. So I met two friends for coffee. And there in this coffee shop, we talked about exploitation. And we talked about trafficking that was happening both foreign and domestic. And as we talked, the question was asked, how do we reach women locally who are exploited? And the answer was given, make baskets and take it to strippers working on Christmas Eve. And I thought I could do that. I didn't think in that moment I'm going to start a ministry. <laughs> I thought in that moment I'm going to do this one-time event and make baskets and take it to strippers on Christmas Eve. So with the help of my church and this friend who asked the right question, we made 25 baskets. And I called a strip club manager and I said, can we bring these baskets on Christmas Eve? He was a little confused as to why, but all he asked was, what goes in the baskets? And I said, fun, girly items. And of course, as a man in his 40s, he knew immediately what those were. So I explained, they might be earrings, nail polish, those cute socks that you get at Target for $1.50, journals, anything that's in our room, ladies, that doesn't go in the need category, but somehow we all have, that's what we put in these baskets. And when we took them, they were received by women with tears in their eyes. Some of them wanted to give us hugs. Others asked how much they owed for the baskets, which we promptly said nothing. They're paid for. And upon leaving the strip club, the question loomed in the air of how do we reach this community on a regular basis? I didn't know, so I Googled it. And I found this woman in Kentucky that took hot homemade meals into 14 different strip clubs. So I called her up and then I drove to Kentucky. And there I was, standing in this strip club, 30 years old, seminary graduate, and I met my first stripper. And she was 62 years old. And she came with everything that was 62. She was a grandmother and she had C-section scars and the skin under her arms was a little more loose, and she had crow's feet. And as I saw this woman, and I remembered Teresa, who didn't plan to be exploited, I knew that this woman didn't plan to work in the sex industry her entire life. And in fact, she had ran away from home. She was going to work in the strip club for one summer at the age of 18. She was going to make a lot of money and then leave her home life for good. It just never happened. And here she was still working there, and her daughter worked at the strip club with her. And as I left the strip club, the next couple of weeks, it came to me that if I wanted to reach women exploited, I had to go into strip clubs. I had to meet women exploited. So I found out and learned all that I could about strip clubs and women who work there. And what I found was, this 62-year-old grandmother looked more like women in the sex industry than what media and movies had told me. Because what I didn't know was that 90% of women who work in the sex industry have been sexually abused under the age of 18. And to put perspective on that, the national average is 25 to 35% of women. What I didn't know was that the age range for women in the sex industry is 14 to 62. And I have seen both multiple times. And I had this idea that women make lots of money working in the sex industry. But the truth is, they have to pay to be there. Sometimes they pay a flat fee of $75 a night. Other time, the money is taken off the tops of their tips. In addition to this money, they have to pay the bouncers, the managers, and the DJs a fee. One woman told me that after eight hours of work, she only made $35 for the whole day. One stripper did write in her book, Scars and Stilettos, that she made $10,000 in cash. But when she got home, 
the boyfriend, or pimp, took all of that money. He said, I need $10,000. But she gave it to him because she was trapped in this system of exploitation through abuse and fear and shame. Those are some pretty daunting statistics. And I want to share with you a statistic of hope. That the number one reason a woman leaves the sex industry is through a trusting relationship encouraging her to do so. So I thought, why not me? And this is what Route One does. We train teams of women to go into strip clubs. And these women are house moms and bus drivers. They're students and they are lawyers. They're black and white. There's women in their 20s and women in their 50s. Right? And we go into strip clubs and we meet with the women who work there without agenda, but we go in to hear their story. And we just bring these little gifts that say you are treasured. And I would say at first the women were skeptical of us being there. But now women run to meet us at the door and pull us into the dressing room because they want to share their week with us. We've been invited to kids' birthday parties. We have helped them prepare for interviews. We've helped them find affordable child care. But my favorite is when we go into a strip club that we've been in for a while, and there's a girl upside down on the pole doing her thing, stops mid-act to say, hey, ladies, wait, I want to talk to you before you leave today. Because it's a trusting relationship that encourages them to change the dial on their life. We started with 25 baskets in one strip club with four little volunteers in a lonely schoolhouse parking lot. Last year, we delivered 145 baskets to eight strip clubs. We have 50 volunteers that serve with us throughout the year, but most importantly, we have 36 women that we work with on a weekly basis because nobody plans to be exploited. Thank you.